Hey, AP Calculus AP students, Mr. Record here from Avon High School, taking a look at our second example from topic 5.7, as you can see, which is all about analyzing functions, but we're going to do so using a table of values, uh, which is a little bit of a different approach, but it's an approach that is oftentimes implemented on questions on the AP exam, and it does kind of take out some of the rigorous ugly work that one would have to do with taking a derivative or solving an equation. So if you know the concept of function analysis, you can score really well on these kinds of questions. So why don't we take a look? So our example two starts with some text that says given the table or given the values below for x, f of x, f prime of x, and I probably should note that f double prime of x is in the table as well along with the fact that f prime of x has only two zeros on the interval negative 3 to 10 and f double prime of x has only two zeros on the interval negative 3 to 10. It says to answer each of the following questions. Part A. Identify all the x values where f has a relative min and we're asked to justify using the first derivative test. Part B. Identify all the x values where f has a relative maximum, but we're justifying now using the second derivative test. Part C will ask us to identify all the x values where there's a point of inflection, and again, we have to justify. And then for good measure, we're going to throw in a part D. What is the equation of the tangent line to the curve f of x when x is 5? So let's scroll back to the top and dive into our first question. Now, if you remember, whenever you were finding relative minima and using the idea of the first derivative test, what we're looking for initially is where are our critical points or our critical numbers. And we know that those occur when f prime is 0 or when f prime is undefined. So that's the first focus that you're going to think of here. So if you go to your table, you'll notice that there is an f prime row for you, which essentially means the derivative has already been taken. Wow, how cool is that? And any time that this derivative is equal to 0 or undefined, our critical values have been found. So the critical numbers in this problem are going to be negative 1, positive 3, and 7. Only those numbers have a chance at being our answer for part A. And so you've got it really narrowed down a little bit. So now you have to keep thinking more about what does the first derivative test say. And if you remember, the derivative test says you're looking to see if f prime changes from positive to negative or if it changes from negative to a positive. One of them is a max, the first one, and the other one would be a min. So if we go to our first derivative row, and we see that we have a positive sign on the left side to a negative sign on that side. Well, that, according to our first derivative test, is a max. This problem wants a min. So we don't want to use negative 1 as our answer. If we go to 3, you'll notice that we go from negative to positive, which is exactly what we want for a min. So we know that 3 is going to be an answer, but I don't think 7 is going to be an answer because around this undefined, we have plus on both sides. Now, it will be worth noting, there won't be any monkey business happening in this question. <laughs> now, what do I mean by that? Well, it's not going to be the case that say if we had an x value of 2, that we could have, say, a positive number here, thus causing positive to positive to be around our 0. Because if there was a positive here, that means the intermediate value theorem would guarantee another 0 in between, and the problem already said that f prime has only two zeros. So that's a safeguard against that being a possibility. So we're going to know that f has a relative min at x equal 3. Now we want to go ahead and justify this. 
And I'm going to justify this on the very safe end. In fact, I'll probably have you put maybe a couple of more things that might be required so that you can really generate a really complete answer. So the reason that we have this min is because, first of all, let's establish the fact that the derivative at 3 is equal to 0. So that means that we've got this critical value at 3. But then we have to go on to say that this f prime of x function is changing signs the way it should be to give us a min. We can't just say changing signs. We have to say that it changes from a negative to a positive. And we want to be specific. Where does it change from a negative to a positive? Well, that's happening at x equal 3. Now, you could say changes from negative to positive, so you don't need to put the, the, the article A in there. You could say plus sign, minus sign. It's not the best thing. I see it all the time on the AP exam. We do accept it. You could also be a little bit more thorough and say something along the lines of f of x is less than 0 to the left of x equal 3, and f of x is greater than 0 just to the right. That would work as well. But you want to try to lock in a phrase that you know is going to be accepted on the AP exam and probably use that phrase over and over again so that you can kind of memorize it and lock it in so that you know that uh, it's going to work for you. Okay, let's take a look at part B. In part B, it asks us to identify, identify all the x values where f has a relative maximum. But this time we have to use the second derivative test. Now, if you recall, in the second derivative test, you're still going to look for when your first derivative is equal to 0. And that's still going to happen at negative 1 and positive 3. Now, it's something that's not going to happen at 7 for a variety of reasons. Well, we, we have undefined as our first derivative. That's one issue. But we also see that we have 0 for our second derivative. And that's not going to be any conclusive evidence on how this can have its relative uh, max. And besides, the first derivative test fails as well for this having a maximum because the sign doesn't change. So we know that our f function has to have that max at negative 1. We actually discovered that in part a. But the thing that we have to do now correctly is justify it. So to justify a second derivative test, let's establish the fact that there is a first derivative critical number at negative 1 by saying f prime of negative 1 is equal to 0. And then we just simply establish the fact that the second derivative at negative 1 is a positive number, or I'm sorry, a negative number. So we could go ahead and say that that value was negative 1, which is negative, but you could just jump right to the less than 0. And that is all that it would take for the second derivative test. The second derivative test is typically a little bit easier to justify, a little quicker, less writing to justify than the first derivative test. All right, moving on to part C. Identify all the x values where f has a point of inflection. Justify. So in this particular situation, I'm going to erase all of the markings in this table because they're really not going to be helpful anymore. Because we have to t attach point of inflection to the idea of the second derivative. And moreover, it's when the second derivative changes from a plus to a minus or minus to a plus. That's when we have our point of inflection. The only way that you can change from plus to minus or minus to plus is if you have a second derivative that's equal to 0. And lo and behold, we have two possibilities at 1 and 7. Note that those are the two places where f double prime is 0. 
Now, which one or both or neither of these will be our point of inflection? Well, we see that F double prime changes from minus to a plus, so certainly we will include positive 1 as a point of inflection location. But at around the x equals 7, no such luck as we have a plus in both situations. So we're going to say that our point of inflection occurs at x equal 1. So we can abbreviate that as F has a POI, <laughs> P-O-I, don't worry, we see it all the time on the AP exam, at x equal, and remember that was at positive 1, positive 1. Why? Because we can go ahead and establish the fact that the second derivative is equal to 0, and couple that with the fact that the second derivative changed signs. Now, in this particular case, you do not have to state how it changes signs at x equal 1. If you wanted to say that f double prime is negative to the left and positive to the right, that would be probably a good idea. It would be more descriptive. But you, generally speaking, are going to be fine with a statement like that. And in part d, what is the equation of the tangent line at x equal 5? Well, if you look at this problem, this is like a, a bit of a, a throwback question back to really unit 2. The two ingredients to write the equation of a line have always been a point and a slope. That allows you to use the point-slope formula. Right now we have half of a point, an x-coordinate. We find the y-coordinate by plugging the 5 in for the function x in for the x value of the function f. So if we go to our table, f of 5 is this number here, 3. And I apologize for having to scroll a little bit. So f of 5 is 3. Our slope, hopefully a good calc student by now knows that the slope is just the derivative. So the derivative of f at 5 is going to be 2. Notice I'm using this first derivative row here. So I have a slope of 2, done scrolling. And now I can write my equation as y minus the y value equals the slope quantity x minus the x value. And I will always prefer that you leave that answer in point slope form so you don't run the risk of making a mistake trying to solve y. So there you go, our problem that involves using a table of values to perform some function analysis. Hope this helps. We'll see you next time.